And I would test it again. All right, got it. Thank you. Dalton. You're awesome. Sorry. Is it C? Nope. Okay. Trying to figure it out, so we're ready to go. Um, I just wanted to let you know that our next lecture is at Swanner Nature Preserve um, on December 6th. Rather than having it here, we're going to be at Swanner. So we just wanted to let you know ahead of time. Right? And the 2024 lectures will be up soon. So December 6th is our last lecture this year. So thank you all for coming. Enjoy. I'm going to turn it over to Kim. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming out tonight uh, to listen to a talk that Sandy and I are going to share. We'll just be taking turns throughout the next hour. Uh, my name is Mark Danninger. Um, I have a background in mining engineering, mostly open pit mining. Uh, but a little bit underground, and um, I've been interested in mining history since I was a little kid growing up in Colorado. So uh, Sandy and I are going to talk about Solon Spiro, who is a well-known um, mining leader in the Park City community for probably around 25 years. Some of you may know about the Spiro Tunnel, and uh, you know we're going to talk about why it's called that. There's a lot of other interesting facts about Mr. Spiro that we'll get into tonight, so I think you'll quite enjoy our uh, conversation. Okay. I'm Sandy Brumley. Uh, I actually know nothing about I don't know that stuff. I slept with a holiday in blast. <laughs> And it was nice. <laughs> anyway, you know, we're in the middle of moving. So, uh, so anyway, Mark and I, uh, you know, started talking about Soul and Spiro a while back. And, uh, you know, we realized that there, uh, you know, there are some some legends about Spiro that, that maybe are a little bit unfair. And so uh, what the story we're going to tell today is, is going to you know, look at that legend, uh, look at the man, and uh, really kind of explore who he really was and whether or not it's fair uh, that the legend is it supports the legend. So the first thing we discovered is there's actually a bus, I don't know if you know this, it's called the Sparrow 101. It goes from Kimball Junction all the way to the Park City Mount Resort and on up to Deer Valley. And as far as we can determine, it's the only bus that's named after anybody. And so Sparrow is unique in this regard. <laughs> we did a little research. We reached out to High Valley Transit and we said, well, why is it called the Spiro Bus? And they said, well, he's the guy with the tunnel. <laughs> okay. does, does it stop at the tunnel? No. <laughs> Let's look for more stories. I think it's more than fun. Oh, so the legend of Spiro it, which is it, it's a little bit of fair. Uh, he's described as a man who um, came to the town. Uh, he started out as a uh, as a mercantilist working in his uncle's store. Taught himself to become a miner. Uh, he uh, got himself into a major lawsuit with the Silver King Coalition, uh, and uh, he won that lawsuit. Uh, so he won about a nine hundred thousand uh, dollar. Uh, award, and we're going to go into a little deeper detail around how that award came about. Uh, but as the legend goes, he took that $900,000 and plowed it into digging that famous tunnel, uh, and then he went bankrupt. Mm. The Server King took over his property, and they dug another 40 feet and discovered a substantial wealth. Oh, that's, so, so it's kind of a sad story, right? Well, and, and it doesn't leave Spiro in the best of light. So, so that's the myth. Let's look at the myth. <laughs> yeah. Will you stand again? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Solon Spiro was born in Kernick, Russia, 
Um, that area later became a part of the German Empire, okay? But in 1863, he was called Prussia, right? Um, he was born to Jewish parents, and uh, he he then lived primarily in Breslau, Prussia, which is a little north and west of where he was born. Okay. Um, so let's look at a map back then. Okay. So here is what became the German Empire. Okay. Um, and here's here's the town where he was born. So this is now all a part of Poland. So the borders have moved around a lot in the last 150 years. Uh, Prussia, Germany, and after World War II became Poland. Here's Warsaw. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this part is all part of Poland now in the red. It used to be part of um, Germany before that was Prussia. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, where he grew up as a as a boy and a young man, uh, that name of that town was was later changed. Okay, um, so let's just talk about his his background here. Uh, he received basic schooling in what is now uh, what was Prussia, uh, possibly also some vocational training and university prep. Um, his, his family was in the uh, retail environment. They had some, some shops and mercantiles over there. So at a very early age, he started working in the family business. Um, on September 9th, 1881, at the age of 18, he traveled from his home in Prussia directly to Park City. And what's interesting about that most immigrants, when they came to America in those days, would spend some time in New York City, let's say, or Boston or Chicago, uh, with family in those areas, in the ethnic neighborhoods. And why uh, Soul and Spiro did not do that is because he had an uncle living here in Park City. And this uncle uh, was his sponsor and provided for passage to come directly to Park City. Okay. Uh, his uncle is uh, was uh, M. S. Eschheim, who also ran a very large and successful mercantile in Park City, probably the most notable mercantile. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sol and Spirals sailed aboard the Alamania on the Hamburg America Line, okay, directly to uh, New York City, and then he took a train out here. Um, all uh, the passenger manifest on this ship would have everybody's name, age, gender, and what their occupation was. Uh, his occupation was listed as Kaufmann. That's German for merchant. Um, he was processed at Castle, Castle Clinton Immigration Station. Mind you, this is before Ellis Island. Okay, um, That was also located on the southern tip of Manhattan Island. And once he went through all that processing for immigration, he traveled on. Um, to uh, Park City. So yeah, just a quick personal note. Uh, he's actually from an area right near a town called Osman, uh, well, like in here, uh, which is where my grandfather is from. <laughs> my grandfather came over in 1914. He actually deserted the Kaiser's army. He's been drafted. And so he came here and became a miner. So my first Nice. All right. <laughs> Any relation to someone? No, no. Okay. About. Okay. All right. So the MS Ashine Mercantile Company was located at the site of the current Veterans Memorial Building, if anybody knows where that is, 427 Main Street. It operated from about 1879 to 1903 under the MS Ashine name. Okay. In 1903, the business was sold to the Blythe and Fargo. So uh, according to the park record, uh, it was a dry goods, clothing, groceries, boots, shoes, minor supply, generally wines, liquors, and cigars. Right? So, I mean, you can pretty much get everything you need there. The most vices and things needed for work, right? All right. Um, yeah, in due course, 
uh, Spiro became the store manager. I believe that was around 1890, so nine years after he arrived. During this time period, he saved his meager earnings to purchase mining stocks in Little Bell Mine, the Huffington Mine, and acquire ownership of several smaller mining claims in the district. Also, during this time, he regularly engaged with customers, and customers were people in mining. And he struck up a lot of friendships and conversations with these people. And he started to learn about the mining business. Okay. And uh, he was a very astute gentleman, and he paid attention. Um, and at some point, he decides, you know, I'm going to start buying penny stocks and acquiring some claims. Claims that weren't high profile, and a lot of people didn't pay attention. Okay. So he was already, from an early time in his time here in Park City, an astute student uh, of mine, right? Okay, um, a little bit more background so we can get to know him a little more. Uh, in 1888, Spiro became a naturalized U.S. citizen in Utah District Court, so seven years after arrival. <laughs> Excuse me. In April of 1888, Spiro, one of the most quiet and peaceable young men in town had a run-in with R.W. Bob Davis, night foreman at the Marsac Mill. Davis and, and D.C. McLaughlin had been drinking in the saloon across the street from M.S. Asham and called over to Spiro to tease him. They then bullied and roughed him up, taking his watch and other values. Spiro, Spiro filed charges and Davis lost his job at the Marsac and was fined $50. All right, so and Mark, as you know, this is just the kind of controversy that I like. What Mark's going on here? Um, this is uh, this was Jupe. Uh, they they threw him out, and he's over at the store. They're in the bar. They're thinking, let's let's go rouse the soul and bring him out on the street. Uh, but they perhaps they dated the wrong Jew, right? Because the the outcome was, even though these guys were fairly substantial people, right? The, the guy that runs the Marset Mill, it's a big mill in town. It's owned by E.P. Ferry. Uh, D.C. McLaughlin is basically Ferry's consigliere, his, his lawyer. Uh, and so uh, it's it's somewhat interesting that the two of them first would attack him. Uh, then the coverage in the newspaper is, is fairly even in, right? So so what they maybe didn't realize is that Solomon Spiro's connection to Ansheim, uh, they, they're very much connected with the power structure of the city. Uh, Sam Radden, editor of the newspaper, Ferry, uh, Hansheim, uh, R.C. Chambers, they were all members of the Freemasons. And so uh, the Spiro was a lot more well-connected, perhaps, than uh, this point. Foreman realized not only did he get a $50 fine, pretty substantial fine in those days, uh, he lost his job. So uh, he crossed the road. Yeah. And if I call your attention to this uh, Statement here in quotes. This came from the uh, park record. Solon Spiro was very well liked and respected in town. He had a lot of credibility. In fact, it led directly to um, Davis getting fired from the Marsac. Um, Davis was a foreman, which is about middle management, pretty substantial job. And they just weren't going to tolerate his kind of bullying. So, um, it just indicate, indicated to us um, that even at an early age, after having been here for seven years, he was well established. In the okay. so for our Jewish friends, he was a Baka. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, some other points of interest here he was the chairman of the Park City Fourth of July Celebration Executive Committee and Reception Committee during the 1890s. Um, while he was still living in Park City. He was elected assistant secretary for the Bogan Silver Mining Company in 1895. Um, the park record also indicates that he uh, built two cottages on Woodside Avenue during the summer and fall of 1895 that he subsequently rented out. And he was manager of the Ashheim String Orchestra 
which performed for many Park City occasions. So he's a very busy guy. Right. So this is one of the few photos that we found of Solon Sparrow. There he is. This is his wife. And this is R.C. Chambers here. And this photograph was taken at the Ontario Mine Office, I believe around 1900, so about a year before R.C. Chambers passed away. Um, R.C. Chambers figured very big in Solon's life. He was a mentor um, to Solon, helping him along, learning about mining, learning about how to make investments, how to acquire claims, how to raise money um, from investors to purchase, you know, mining equipment, mining companies, and things like that. So this is a pretty, pretty cool photograph there. Mm -hmm. Here's a photograph outside of the Ontario Mine Office, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, this is R.C. Chambers in the sleigh, and this is Mr. and Mrs. Solon Spiro, mm -hmm. okay? So, so what's... Can I add something? Yes. Um, I wrote a little bit about his wedding uh, in anticipation for this lecture. And so um, this photo was most likely taken just a few weeks after they had gotten married. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the, his uh, wife, Ida May, in a minute. Thanks for adding that, Dallin. Appreciate that. Um, so just a little bit on the RC Chambers friendship. R.C. Chambers was an acquaintance of M.S. Ashheim when both were working in California, okay, before anyone ever came to Park City. Um, he provided support to M.S. Ashheim to open his mercantile in Park City in 1875 and acquired controlling interest in M.S. Ashheim mercantile in 1900 before his passing in 1901. So there was a family relationship um, when Solon's uncle worked with R.C. Chambers in California. Um, this is, I don't think you guys can see this here. Yeah, okay. This is one of many advertisements in the Park City record over the, the decades of MS Ashram ownership. And I will call your attention to this. It says, uh, beautiful piano lamp. Okay, part of this advertisement, and this just goes to show how creative Mr. Spurrow was. Um, he had a contest. He, he indicated this in this advertisement that anybody who works at a mine, if you have a favorite foreman, please come into the store and write it on a piece of paper and put it in this canister. Okay. It's a public vote, basically. And at the end of some time period, I'll go through the canister and pull out the names, and the foreman with the most names or votes will get a free piano lamp. All right? <laughs> so you can imagine these miners coming into the store, maybe on their own to get a pair of boots, maybe with their wives or wife or girlfriend, and, uh, you know, they'll fill out a slip of paper and say, well, I like Bob. He's a great guy. You know, if Bob got 27 votes more than anybody else, Bob gets a piano. So that's how he got, you know, customers interested in what, he's, what his uh, business is and coming into the store, making a little fun of it. Mm -hmm. you know. so, yeah, so he's a, obviously the Henshaw store is probably the biggest advertiser for the tank connection to, to Sam Rad and there. Uh, and that probably led to uh, Sam writing this little promotional article for Solon uh, about a freak of nature, right? This is a spring that's flowing in the basement of the Ashland store. And Solon is now claiming that it's got medicinal properties. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a mocker, right? Mocker to a little bit of that too sometimes. Uh, so it's probably a good setup for uh, his, his future as a miner. All right, while we're speaking of the store, um, MS Ashheim's burned down in the Great Fire of 1898. And according to the park record, um, Solon Spiro was interviewed, and he mentions that he had an offer to be the sole distributor in Manila, Philippines, 
for Schlitz beer. <laughs> and he was uh, quoted as saying there's millions in it. <laughs> he declined the offer and proceeded to rebuild the store with his uncle while continuing to pursue mining stocks. The new store opened in September of 1899 in the same location where the one uh, that burned down. Yeah. There you go, Sam. So, that that Huxgrens is probably good stuff. You've heard this uh, this quote from uh, from uh, Mark Twain. Uh, it's actually attributed to several different people, but a mine is hole in the ground with a liar on top. Uh, is that what Spiro was? Well, you gotta you gotta embellish, right? So so that's uh, that's kind of how he got into the business. Uh, as promised, we're going to talk about his marriage to Ida May. Uh, she was a prominent uh, person from actually in Cincinnati. And so through this marriage connection, he developed connections with uh, capitalists in Cincinnati. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's where he got a lot of the financing for the mines that he eventually developed. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, uh, they, they, they toured the East, uh, they visited principal cities, they went to uh, Germany. Uh, while in Germany, there were rumors back in Park City, there were all these rumors in Park City, uh, that, that he was over there fighting for the Kaiser. Not true, but, uh, but people will talk when, uh, when the boss is away, right? Uh, and uh, as far as we can tell, by, by 1890, he'd moved to actually to Salt Lake City with his bride, uh, and he would come up uh, pretty frequently to Park City to, to manage his interests. So uh, he basically, uh, his his career path then is is kind of establishing a reputation with uh, with the Lucky Bill and Quincy mines. Uh, those were located just up above where uh, above the Montage today. Uh, he sold them out actually to Daly, who was running the the, the, the Daly West mine. Uh, rolled that money into other developments, uh, and that's uh, uh, that's that's kind of how uh, he became the miner that he became. Uh, additional background on him: he was a member of the Elks and commercial clubs. So he was a mover and shaker in, in clubs around town, served in juries uh, in Park City. Uh, he began driving an automobile up here in the uh, beginning of the century. Eventually, he traded up to a, uh, a uh, Stutz Bearcat. So he moved uh, him some pace like, like a good car. Uh, ultimately, he had uh, uh, no children, but was an advocate. Uh, Spiro's yeah, they traveled east for business in New York City. Uh, they uh, they endured several uh, he endured several lawsuits over the, the course of his career, which simply meant that he was a good miner, right? Mm -hmm. For a miner in Park City, you got sued, uh, and so Spiro Spiro also he sued and he was and he was sued. Uh, most of the claims were uh, that he underpaid uh, dividends in his mining uh, uh, pursuits, but uh, you know those were all. Uh, is proven in court. So uh, ultimately, you know, he's seen as a very, uh, you know, sensible, stable guy. Okay, additional background. The Spiros uh, began to split their time in the, in the early 20s between New York and Park City, right? So, so he basically was a successful miner who, who began to move on to other pursuits. Uh, he was elected to uh, the, the, uh, the uh, a board of directors for the American Mining Congress. So he was a well-respected miner around the country. Uh, and the couple actually moved full-time to New York City by about 1923. Uh, the, the mine operation for the, uh, the King Khan mine by the, by the mid-20s was, was kind of fading. Uh, and he actually sold to Silver King Coalition. Uh, so uh, uh, he was uh, he was also a member of the Criterion Club, the Athletic Club, the Automobile Club of New York. Uh, we had mine interests in, uh, we had interest in Florida real estates. Uh, and the last time uh, this, the Spiros visited uh, Salt Lake City was in, in 1927. Uh, and uh, after a brief illness, he passed away in 1929. <laughs> let's, let's go back and take a closer look at, uh, at how he became a mine American. And, uh, and, and why he really should be a respected about that. Yeah, thank you, Sam. <laughs> so you'll notice that uh, so long of his wife, Ida May, didn't have any children. So consequently, they're very engaged in the activities of the Paramount Travel. 
some of that travel was for funding, some of it was for raising capital and investments. <clears throat> All right, so this is the, the first operating mine that Solon Spiro was involved in. You're probably familiar with the little bell orbit that's up there. Um, and was, as we mentioned earlier, Solon had been buying uh, mining stock and claims for quite a few years. <clears throat> Uh, 1899, uh, 1900, he decides that um, he'd like to get out of the mercantile thing, but he'd been doing full time and focus his energy and effort on mining. Okay, so in 1900, he acquired ownership of this mine here in Little Bell with financial backing from Simon, who was Bamberger, and he became the general manager of the mine. Now, think of this. General manager of the mines is pretty high up in the organization structure. And most of the time you hear about people doing this, who actually started as an underground miner, you know, and then became a shift supervisor, shift boss, then foreman or superintendent, then mine manager or general manager. So he was able to, to jump to the head of the line because he had his act together. All right. And you know, he learned a lot from his discussions with various customers of the store, and I believe R.C. Chambers was very influential in making connections. Um, Spiro does invest his own money um, as much as you know he could, but he mainly raises money from investors to back his adventures. His ventures. <laughs> so to do that, you have to have pretty compelling story. You have to be very influential. You have to know what you're talking about to convince people to fork over their hard-earned money, right? So, um, and as Sandy mentioned, most of his investors were in Cincinnati, uh, New York, and locally in Salt Lake and Park City. In 1901, he became president of the Lucky Bill Mine, so the following year, okay? All right, so here we have a um, photograph of the King Con mine. Um, this would have been after Spiro got involved, so it would have been after 1908, but prior to 1916, before the tram, aerial trams. Right. Um, and there's a picture of King Con over here. Uh, a little different view, um, but you can already see a different. This is an earlier picture on the wall compared to here because now we have a covered um, route here for the ore carts to dump waste rock in this pile and ore into the ore bin down here. Okay, so um, in 1901, Spiro purchased the Bogan Group. Samuel Newhouse from Salt Lake City. Okay, the Bowden Group basically was predecessor to this mine. It was uh, much smaller than it had a shaft, a head frame, and a couple outbuildings and some surrounding claims. Okay, um, and they had this the Bowden Group actually bordered the Silver King Coalition, which is back over here, the next door neighbors. Um, the story goes that John Bogan ran up sizable debt with MS Ashheim, could not secure additional funding to further develop his mine and nearby mining claims. In order to settle this debt, he gave MS 5,000 shares in the Bogan Silver Mining Company, which MS sold to his nephew, Solon Spiro. In 1902, Solon sold his controlling interest in Little Bell and Lucky Bill to John Daly and stayed on to manage both operations for several years. In 1903, Spiro consolidated the Bogan mine and surrounding plains as a Silver King consolidated, right? Otherwise known as the King Con. So the consolidated in that name came from consolidating claims. You call it a Silver King, it's kind of tongue in cheek to the evil empire known as the Silver King Coalition. Okay, so he, this guy had a sense of humor. <laughs> All right. 
Um, so when, once he, he consolidated these claims, he created this Silver King uh, Consolidated Mining Company. He became president and Samuel Newhouse as vice president. Uh, some of the noteworthy initial infrastructure improvements that um, Solon approved and executed right away would be a new hoist house, okay, which is this building right here, it's a steam hoist, um, enclosed uh, head frame. Um, so that would need a new, a new hoist, new boilers, and all the piping and so forth. Shaft was sunk an additional 200 feet to approximately 800 feet below the surface. Um, the ventilation system was installed, uh, larger capacity dewatering pumps, three boarding houses, which are back here. Um, a machine shop, also underground, drift, additional drifts were cut at the 600 foot level. And the Cumberland incline with short laterals were dug to access, access additional water, but also to do exploration to see the more that we found. Right. So here's some pretty rare photos. There are only a few uh, inside some of the buildings at the King Con. This is the boarding house. You can see this is the um, dining room area. Okay, it looks very nice. And uh, this is inside the <laughs> okay. Thank you. I just yeah. fell asleep right there. <laughs> yeah. um, this is it. This is the uh, hoist building, the shaft. This is in here, and here's some miners and their slickers standing in the cage, uh, either ready to go underground or maybe they just came up on the surface. Now, this is a very notable photograph. Um, and we have Mr. Spiro here. So I guess a few years after the photos were taken with R.C. Chambers, who shaved his mustache. <laughs> but um, this is really an important picture to illustrate what type of person he was, okay? He is inside an active mining scope, okay? And these are cross-set, square-set timbers. Okay? And this is, once the uh, ore zone was mined out, you had this big underground cavern, you needed to put in some kind of shoring and support structures to mitigate cavings. And this was done with these big, huge timbers. And there's a great model at the Mining Museum of the Ontario that shows this. And the square set timbering was developed in Virginia City, Nevada mm -hmm. uh, in the 18, late 1860s, early 1870s. And so he climbed all the way up in there, okay? And of course he's dragging the photographer with him, right? Think about the camera equipment that they had to use back then and setting all this clunky, bulky stuff up in there, okay? And I'll challenge anybody to find another black and white photograph from that era that shows John Daly, R.C. Chambers, any of the movers and shakers of these mining companies, um, who you guys, Kearns, yeah. up in a stoke, wearing this Carhartt's canvas type of coat. You can see how dirty he is, and he's checking things out, right? Leadership in the field. That's what I call it. So he's quite a guy. Um, now, just some specifics around the King Con mine. There was significant water inflow as in all the underground mines in the Park City District once they got below 800 feet around there. Okay. Um, and this created a problem with further development of, of the mine, finding new ore, right? So pumping systems were becoming more and more complex. Everyone knows about the Cornish pump up to Ontario. Mm -hmm. And uh, that thing was a monstrosity. Okay? But this, you know, had to be steam power back in the day before electric motors. Um, so there, there were some challenges uh, as, as the mine went deeper. 
The King Kong was listed on the Salt Lake Stock the Mining Exchange on June 16, 1911, with a capitalization of 500,000 shares at $1 per share. In 1913, after many years of litigation with the Silver King Coalition, where they actually mined out King Kong ore and didn't tell anyone about it, they basically robbed the King Kong. The King Kong successfully sued the coalition for $900,000 for ore that had been mined without their knowledge. And so I think the Silver King Coalition also was derelict in paying this fine in a timely manner. So the judge slapped another $200,000 on top of that. Okay, so the little guy can't win, all right? So Sandy is gonna get into a little more on the details of the claim dispute. Yeah, so, that. Yep. so this is just uh, an example of uh, one of the claim books that are over in the, the uh, county seat in, uh, uh, and what they do is document all the way from when the claim was established to, you know, what, how did it change hands over time? Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is the Vesuvius claim. That's one of about 12 claims that were involved in the lawsuit. Uh, and you can, you can basically see the claim was originated by John Bogan, who's the you know, Bogan miner. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, what's, what's interesting when you look a little bit more closely at, at across those claims, uh, how did how did they develop over time? How did this this lawsuit present itself? Well, first of all, there's this guy uh, who Solon Spiro, who's calling himself Silver King Consolidated. Silver King Coalition already exists. Maybe he thought it was funny. I'm not sure they thought it was all that. Funny. Uh, so so there was initially a, you know a rivalry to begin with. Uh, they had already bought uh, as early as 1898. Uh, part of these claims, right? So the, the list kind of shows uh, claims at the top that are jointly owned by the two companies, uh, and then claims at the bottom, which ultimately were part of the settlement uh, where the Silver King went in and actually started, uh, started, uh, pulled out war and, and didn't account to uh, Spiro that they that they take. Uh, so Spiro came in quite a bit later, uh, two to four years later, uh, he's buying from a different audience, right? The Silver King is buying from Joseph Gorlitsky, David Felsen, uh, friends of, of the coalition. Uh, Spiro's buying from the Bogan. And he's spending a fairly uh, substantial portion of money to buy those claims, $150,000 back in the day, to buy himself into a partnership. <laughs> uh, and so uh, you can imagine he might have been upset that you know, he wasn't seeing proceeds from this and that's what that's what led to the lawsuit. Uh, this is my favorite little uh, finding from, from the, uh, the exercise. What I'm showing here in the in the red oops, in the red uh, those are the claims that are 100 percent owned by uh, King Kong. The yellow claims are the joint claims. And here is the Silver King shaft, here's the King Kong shaft. And so when you come off the top of the crescent chairlift, they're right there. And you're looking up this saddle right here. This is this is where the yurt is. This is where home run is coming down this way. So that's where those disputed claims lie. Uh, you're just you're standing at the surface. Uh, all of this case was 1,200 feet down in the ground. But it's kind of fun to think of it when you scoot by there. That's uh, that's the source of those claims. So uh, ultimately, uh, the uh, the suit was settled as as uh, Mark mentioned. Uh, there was a suit, uh, there was a countersuit, uh, and finally the judge said, all right, enough already. Uh, you're going to pay the original settlement plus $200,000 worth of interest for, for dragging your feet. Uh, and that's how that the suit ended. Uh, going forward from there, uh, uh, Spiro picked up a substantial portion of cash. He was able to invest further. Uh, he sank the, uh, uh, the shaft deeper. Uh, the property grew. He grew the property from uh, to over 600 acres by about 1915. Uh, he did start digging that tunnel. Uh, he acquired the California Comstock Mine, which is further up Thames Canyon. Uh, and until the early 1920s, uh, he was patenting and purchasing uh, numerous claims uh, in that area. Let's look at another map. Um, right here, uh, whoops. Right here is where uh, Silver Star is, right? So, uh, and, the, and the mouth of the tunnel is right there by the, by the Silver Star Cafe. 
that tunnel goes three miles up the canyon uh, and it does a little jink to get over to the Comstock properties. Uh, but what he was seeking to do was not only drain this property, he also filed all of these claims all up and down the canyon uh, with the eye that, uh, yeah, you know, maybe if I'm digging this tunnel, I'm going to discover some additional ore. And so the dream of discovering ore was absolutely true. It was there, uh, but he never really hit pay dirt in, in this tunnel. So, what do you want? Thanks. <clears throat> All right, you can also get an idea, especially with the map that Sandy showed a few minutes ago, how complex mining law was and litigation. All these connected claims and some of them on top of each other, and it's just got to be a nightmare to work through that. Um, here's just an example uh, of the or quality that came out of King Con in 1915. Um, all the mines at that time, by today's standards, would be considered high grade mines. Okay. Or like what was pulled out of the mountains back then really doesn't exist anymore. Um, the easy stuff has been acquired. Let's put it that way. The uh, Park City record ended up dubbing King Khan the biggest little mine in the camp. And that's saying something. Um, when, when the contenders are the Silver King Coalition, the Ontario, and the Daily Judge, Daily West Holdings, okay, and you're firmly at number four, that's a pretty big deal. Okay, so here's some production values um, for the year. Think about this, huh? <laughs> 652,000 troy ounces of silver, 605,000 troy ounces of gold, 7.8 million pounds of lead. Oh, wow. how many batteries is that, right? 411,000 pounds of copper, okay? It, uh, throughout the year, uh, $255,000 uh, with this first as dividends. Okay, and there was a monthly net income of thirty thousand dollars for the mining company, which is about nine hundred thousand today's dollars. Okay, all right. So here is some uh, photographs of the surface infrastructure. Um, this here is the electrical rotor for an air compressor. Okay. So these are all copper windings going around iron um, iron flywheel. Okay, and here's the here's kind of a, a balancing counterweight. So they were bringing this thing up in pieces, and it's going into this building back here. You can see it's brand new lumber hasn't been painted yet. Okay, um, I believe this was 1914. Here we have the ore bin. Okay, and if you remember in a previous photograph, there's a covered rail tramway here where they pushed the ore cards out. Um, the left fork went to the ore bin, the right fork went to the waste dump. Okay, and wagons were loaded down here, right? And so then the question is, well, what's this business going on over here? Why does it keep going? Because in the early photographs, this stuff was not here. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Hmm. Okay, so 1916 was a big year for the King Con. Um, all these three things started happening. Okay, construction of an aerial tram. At that time, it was the second aerial tram in the district. At the end of mining in Park City, there were three aerial trams. This was the second one. The first one being the Silver King Coalition in 1902. All right. Um, so on Sparrow purchased the Griselli uh, zinc mill. Um, and he bought that from uh, John Daly. Okay. And the commencement of what we now call the Sparrow Tunnel. At that time, it was called the Thames Tunnel. All right. So here's, here's a winter photograph of the aerial tram. Um, construction was started in May of 1916 and was completed in November 
There was about two month delay in construction because of uh, parts not being available. The fabricator of the tram system had back orders. Everybody's wanting trams for this one. Mm -hmm. So this photograph is taken somewhere down, maybe with the counterweight structures now off the side. Let's see what uh, that's first time. First time. All right. Mm -hmm. So up here is where the tram crossed Crescent Ridge and went down the back side to the orbit. Okay. So um, this is a pretty, pretty ingenious thing to build uh, because now you can run or downhill and supplies and coal uphill year round. You're not doing that with horse and wagon in the winter. All right. So Mr. Spiro was like, well, look, I'm tired of stockpiling ore waiting for spring thaw. We're going to install this tram so we can mine all year round and, and process the material. Okay, and also bring up coal and various other things. All right. Um, this tram was about 10,000 feet long with 52 um, five cubic foot buckets, these little things hanging here. Okay. Um, tram production capacity is moving 20 tons of ore per hour, traveling at 400 feet per minute down to the mill. And the ore, really, really heavy compared to stuff coming up. Once you start load, loading um, these cars, these buckets, I mean, when they were coming down the Park City side of Crescent Bridge, this thing no longer needed a motor to drive it. Gravity operated the whole thing. It needed a motor to start it, get it moving, okay? So they could bring coal up, <coughs> drill steel, timber, paint, explosives, and everything could come up. All right. Now, um, also quite cleverly, these tram towers, unlike Daily Judge and the Silver King Coalition, these were built out of wood. It's like, well, why would you do that? Well, it's a hell of a lot cheaper, right? And you could have a local sawmill make the timbers, okay? And it's easy to install. You don't need to rivet it. You don't need to bolt it, right? Um, so, purchase price was cheap, assembly was cheap, and assembly was fast. That's how we got it done in five months. Okay. Can you, I, I, I didn't quite understand the, the starting and the terminus of that frame. Okay, yeah. So, the, uh, the ore was loaded at the ore bin. Which was located at the mine. I mean, plane jumper was there. Okay. Yeah, so but it was a different ore, ore bin than what was used for loading wagons. It had to be because the tram, if you can see here, the cable that is towing it uphill and this arm and the bucket have a total length of about eight feet. Okay, so you have to have more headroom to get this thing in. And then it's got to be loaded from the top, just like a wagon would. But the whole structure is different because it has a drive wheel, just like a chair. Look, you ride a chair, just put a drive wheel on the top, and a motor sitting up there. Except everybody's riding the chair up and not down. So that's why you got to power it the whole day. <laughs> and then at the end, the discharge is at the Griselli Middle. And it's, it's kind of reversed there, where now these tram buckets dumping into ore bins. And where was this mill going? Uh, I'll get to that. Good question. <laughs> All right, so, um, also, okay. I don't know if I have a picture. Oh, here's, here's the um, Crescent Ridge summit area where the tram was transitioning between going uphill and then going down the back side, okay? And you can see here, there's a series of pulleys and cables and steel cable going down in here. And well, what's inside this little A-frame? Well, that's where the counterweights were, okay? Mm -hmm. So there were several counterweight stations. This one took care of the cable tension between the top of the ridge and the ore loading station. 
Okay, then there was another counterweight down on what was that run? First time. First time. <laughs> that took care of the tension on the other side of the truck. Okay. And to give you an idea of the size of this, here's a guy standing there. He's probably doing some kind of maintenance work. See him here? So that's how tall that thing is. So that, that wood is and that's yeah, that, that pile of truck. rubble was still up there. And I mean it's just amazing. There's all there's track sections up here where the carts, the, the buckets transition from the cable to actual <laughs> small gauge railroad track, okay? Because you had to disconnect the cable that it was riding on and run it into the counterweight system, okay? Uh, so if you're ever up there hiking around, you should go check that out. There's some pretty cool stuff laying on the ground there. And of course, the towers that we saw here are all nowadays, they're Huge aspen grove in here, you can't even see them. I don't know. Is there any one of them standing in this one? This one still stays in okay. the They're pretty, pretty bad shape. Sure. But uh, you can see some aspen trees holding it up. Okay. Still yeah. aspen <laughs> um, my wife Joan and I skied down through here about 10 years ago. We didn't know this existed. And we're, we're like skiing in the, the aspen, some fresh cow, and like, whoa, we've seen this couple of towers standing. <laughs> what the hell is this? <laughs> Wow, there was a tram here. I wonder where that went, you know? <laughs> All right. So here's the Griselli Mill right there. Um, oh, before I go to that, just to talk about this. After several months of tramway operation, um, the Salt Lake Mining Review reported in 19, January 1917. That the company saved 75% of the original shipping by wagon and more than 85% of the original cost of upgrades. Remember, coal and supply and steel and so forth. Besides the inestimable, inestimable value of being able to keep its transportation system open both in winter and summer. So, you know, there was a bit of capex required to install this, right? Purchase and install it, but boy, it started paying off right away. So again, Mr. Sparrow was pretty visionary, mm -hmm. right? So here's here's the uh, location of the selling mill that he bought from Mr. Bailey also in 1916. You see here, there's the Rio Grande Railroad out here. There was already a rail spur coming to the mill, okay? Um, so the tram route went from the King Con line over Crest Bridge to the Griselli Mill, which had a railroad spur to the Denver Rio Grande Western. Okay, so the mill and tram terminal ore bins were located in the area of present day Park City Public Works and um, the transit building. So, kind of like behind the Julie Nestor Gallery in that area. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that Masonic Hill right there? Yes, yep, exactly. All right, so um, just a little backstory on this mill. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was primarily a zinc flotation mill uh, built by John Daly in 1909. So it was about a seven year old structure. Um, zinc flotation doesn't work for silver and gold and copper. So equipment modifications had to be made. So you bought this thing and then you got to start yanking out different, you know, the old flotation tables and cyclones and things like that and put in different stuff. Okay. So it wasn't turnkey. Um, uh, when Mr. Sparrow purchased the mill in the spring, uh, shortly thereafter, he made the equipment changes and um, it was operational in 1916. Keep in mind, the timing of getting this thing running needed to coincide with the commissioning of the aerial tram so they could work together. All right. um, the mill also included a sampler. Maybe you've heard about that, a sampler of this, sampler of that, and that is so they could check the quality of the ore. Okay, that information goes back to the mining engineers and geologists and surveyors so they can mark where to proceed with mining. It's also used in confirming what they have with what they're going to send to the smelter out in Garfield. Okay. Um, the mill in this case was not only used to process high grade ore, but it was used to concentrate low-grade ores that normally they couldn't deal with. 
Okay, that would have to go out in a waste dump. The lower grade ores would have to then be sent to smelting to get the value out of it. Right? So you're sending stuff to the smelter, you're calling it ore. You got to keep track of what you're sending in because you can't trust the smelter telling you what you ship them. Right? So it's checks and balances. Um, the upgrades to the mill were targeted to be 50 tons per day. Um, processing rate is initially with a future capacity expansion of 150 to 200 tons per day. Right? So the mill, excuse me, the mine is shipping you 20 tons of ore a day. So if you target 50 tons, that's good, you know, um, because if you got to shut the mill down for maintenance, you don't want to shut the mine down. So the mine keep mining, keep sending ore, you can stockpile up new ore bins, you know, you have a maintenance turnaround for five days, seven days, whatever it is, fine. Let it build, and then we can start processing it. Okay. All right, so here's a close-up view of the new and improved mill. Now it's called the King Kong Mill. You can see here uh, the last or first tower for the tram, depending on which direction you're going. So the tram cars went in this little structure here, and uh, then dumped into ore bins. And then uh, the ore bins would be drawn from the bottom and, and start the ore would start its way through the mill. Okay. So as I mentioned, um, they had to keep separate the low grade ore from the high grade ore. Okay. High grade ore could be processed directly um, in, you know, without any smelting. Um, and the low grade ore would go on the uh, Rio Grande Railroad through over Parley's Summit, down Parley's Canyon, and out to Garfield to the Asarco, or excuse me, Murray, the Murray Smelter, uh, Asarco Smelter in Murray, so American Smelter and Refining Company. Where Intermountain Healthcare is. <laughs> now, one of the other aspects of this was a uh, crushing and grinding circuit and flotation. So the run of mine rock, you know, would have been two or three inches on the small end up to eight or 10 or maybe 12 inches chunk of rock and that had to be crushed down by something that could be processed. Okay. All right. The other big happening for the King Con, of course, was the building of the Spiro Tunnel. So here's the, uh, the waste dump of the rock they were pulling out. Um, the, the tunnel opening is back in here somewhere. So as Sandy said, up there at the Silver Star Complex, there's a view inside the tunnel. Um, double tracked for most of its way. So uh, you can see all the timbering that had to be used, a very expensive venture. Here's a ventilation truck alongside, okay. Um, so, a lot of times we think of, well, this the reason that Mrs. Spiro wanted to put this in was for dewatering. Um, and that's not entirely accurate. By 1916, electric motors have been very uh, well developed. And you can get them and you know, one horsepower size up to 300 horsepower size. And they were reliable. So if you were just focused on dewatering your mine, you could have used electric motors and pumps up at the mine. Okay, they're a hell of a lot cheaper than putting in a three mile tunnel. Okay, and you could never use enough electricity to not make it loud, right? So the tunnel helps in facilitating draining. Here's the problem. This tunnel was gonna intersect the bottom of the King Kong of 1,800 feet. Well, the mine isn't going to stop there. It's going to keep going down, right? When you get below that 1,800 feet where the water would naturally accumulate at the bottom of the shaft and run out this way, well, then what's going to happen when the mine goes deeper? Okay? They had this problem with the Sutro Tunnel in Virginia City. They had these problems everywhere. So it wasn't specifically a drainage tunnel, right? Um, it facilitated that, yes. But a lot of the reason for doing this is to do exploration. 
Okay, this is before diamond drilling and computer modeling and all this. You had to actually put in tunnels and drifts and raises to find ore. So this would allow the King Khan to punch out laterals every few hundred feet to look for ore all the way down three miles. Okay. Um, potentially, if this tunnel connected at the bottom of the King Khan, it could also be used for transportation. Right, as, as an alternative to the aerial train. And it's always nice to have other ways to get men and material and ore to your mine or out of your mine instead of just one way, especially in the winter. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of other reasons for doing this. Um, Mr. Sparrow continued to excavate this tunnel for the next seven years. Okay. Uh, in 1923, it had achieved the desired length, exceeding 15,000 feet, and connected with the California Comstock Workings. Okay, and uh, we'll let uh, Randy take over. All right, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit because we're actually at six o'clock hours. Okay. Yeah, got to finish up our yeah. story here real quick. Um, so, uh, so, so the myth, the aspect of the myth that talked about him taking that nine hundred thousand dollars and plowing it into the tunnel, not entirely true, because between that settlement in nineteen seventeen uh, and nineteen twenty three, you've got a very successful mine that's that's operating, that's throwing revenue, that's, that's paying dividends, uh, and so a lot of this investment in aerial trams and tunnels is is coming out of current operating, right? So. Uh, so uh, it's important to kind of understand um, the, uh, remember too, at this point in time, Spiro is is uh, is kind of stepping back, right? He and his wife are spending a little bit more time in New York City. Terry and I do that too. Uh, a little bit time in Florida. We don't do that so much, but, uh, uh, but uh, you know, he's stepping back from the mining operations. And so by this time, as the, as the, the, the holdings that he's discovered to that point are playing out, uh, he's stepping back. And so by 1924, uh, he sells out to the Silver King and Coalition. Uh, to the Silver King, those years were extremely profitable. 1925 was actually uh, their most profitable year uh, at all. Uh, and so uh, they, they dabbled a little bit in the Spiro Tunnel uh, until about uh, 1927 is when they started looking at it a lot more closely uh, and, and developing the property. Uh, and so um, there's a series of newspaper reports that talk about discoveries. Um, we look very closely at annual reports, uh, annual reports from mining companies in the 20s, very opaque. <laughs> they didn't tell you much at all about where they were actually making the discoveries. Uh, but from what you can tell from the newspaper reports, uh, if indeed there was a substantial discovery, and we're gonna have a written opinion on that, it was somewhere along uh, the Spiro Tunnel, uh, there was a development called the West End Shaft that was created at that time as reported prominently in the newspaper. Uh, and there are several newspaper reports about substantial findings in the tunnel. Uh, nothing specific. So uh, best guess is that it came from the West End Shaft. So this notion of the 40 feet, uh, that maybe is the 40 feet they're talking about right there. Uh, but uh, it's not just 40 feet. It's a shaft. So there was a substantial investment made to get to that additional ore body. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in fairness to, to Mr. Spiro, uh, it wasn't a mere food. So anyway, uh, we're, we're looking again at this myth. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to talk about Mythbusters, our city edition. <laughs> and we're going to call that Mythbusters. So, so I'm busting it because I think there were substantial findings, uh, but there was also a substantial investment around them. Uh, the, uh, the direct progression of Spiro taking that nine hundred thousand dollars and reinvesting it, uh, you know, it's it's not the sad story uh, that that uh, you know that Thompson and Buck fell in, in the treasure. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Mark, I know it's a slightly different perspective on that. Maybe you want to share. Yeah. 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 There. All right. So some of this is terminology. 
Um, we talk about four. And as you can imagine, in the 1920s, newspaper writing was a little more colorful and liberal than it is today. And uh, the Park City Record and Salt Lake Mining Review and others were all big supporters of the mining industry because, you know, it helped grow the economy. And um, I think things were kind of sugar-coated at that time. Uh, if you did find something that was low-grade, maybe resembled or all of a sudden, they found an ore! It's a mother load. Everybody's running into the hills to go mining, okay? It was also sometimes intentionally deceitful to attract investors. No one's going to put money in a loser, right? And you're not going to say, well, it's marginal ore. Well, it actually is, okay? So it's not that ore wasn't found. I don't believe it was of much value. It was not enough to pay for the cost of mining, okay? Not for a larger mining company like the coalition that had a lot of overhead, okay? If I'm out there with a barrel and a pick and a shovel and a wheelbarrow, okay, I might be able to, you know, scrape together a couple of dollars of silver, but I'm not paying for the big operating dollars of a, a large mining company, okay? The other thing, um, the Silver King Coalition pretty much abandoned all the surface infrastructure of the King Con shortly after their purchase in 1944. It's no longer being used for mining. Um, this, the, the Spiro Tunnel was never used to haul ore out. Why would they? The mill is up by the Bonanza Cheryl, right? Why would you haul it out into Park City and have to haul it all the way through town and back around wherever that hill sits in? No way. If they found ore over there, they would have punched a drift from the King Kong area all the way to the main shaft of Silver King Coalition and hauled ore right over to there, up there. Uh, hoist, right? So, um, but anyway, we agree. This is busted. Yeah, it's, <laughs> but it's more busted in my view. <laughs> He's hedging his bets. It's just kind of busted. <laughs> I'm saying totally busted, all right? And we all know when the Thames was put in by the Silver King uh, in the late 30s, that was an exploration mine. It was never a producing mine. It wasn't supposed to be. They wanted to find more ore. And if they found ore, they would have put this tunnel from that area, like, you know, the Thames, you know, California Comstock, the, the head end or the, the back end of the Spiral Tunnel, they would have pushed, punched the drift all the way to whatever 1800 foot station is from the Silver King Coalition and hoist the war up there. Right? Now, but see, we're still going to argue because why would they have dug the Thames shaft if they hadn't found ore in the West End? Because it didn't allow for enough access vertically. <laughs> They're going to check, you know, 300 foot low, 500 foot low, 700 foot low, all the way down, punching uh, drifts out, you know, east, west, north, south, and head. All right. So, anyway. Um, however, the Spiro Tunnel had a very long life, right? Um, it was the underground subway from 1965 to 69, only four years. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and here you can see this. Whoops. Skeeter's reading the sign that the uh, United Park Mine Company put in there at Thames Shaft Station. And this is where the skier would get out of the subway and then go to the surface. Um, and you can see here, oops, sleep there. <laughs> Uh, one of the photos there shows people getting into the little covered transport cars on this underground electric railroad. And here's where you put your skis and these cubbies. Um, what's interesting is this was an overhead trolley line electric train, right? And so, you know, I just, I'm just wow, man, people skis on their shoulders and uh, walking around. <laughs> that could be a shocking experience. <laughs> I don't think it's. Um, 
So here's uh, people loading up at the uh, Silver Star area, getting in their cars, and here's that. Still thing. a lift line. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's better than an amusement park, right? <laughs> I would have been riding this all the time. <laughs> um, and here's the things. All right, and then uh, there was, I guess, an underground science lab and a mining museum. Maybe some of you were around at that time and might know about this. I had never heard this. And then they did train rides, uh, just underground <laughs> mine tours in the 70s. And uh, here's now they're, you know, painted nice colors. And, you know, people wearing shorts and flip flops right here, flip flops. <laughs> Going in an underground mine. Like, how the hell do they get by with that? <laughs> no, no MSHA. Okay. It's cold. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, for a long time, we've been getting a uh, water supply to Park City out of the spiral tunnel. You can see here the electric locomotive, and here's the rod that connects to the high tension wire up there. You know, that doesn't look safe to me, Mark. <laughs> well, you know, uh, hopefully they have electricians. PMing this doing preventive maintenance because if you have a ground fault here, he was water. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> I mean, it just where's M shot, right? <laughs> All right. So look, in closing, um, we just want to say a couple of things about Mr. Stirl. Okay. Um, he really did live the American dream, uh, especially for immigrants at that time, right? Um, I mean, you know, he kind of got OG on a job training as a store clerk, became the manager of his uncle's store, um, started taking an interest in mining activities, who's who, and buying up, you know, penny stocks and claims. Um, keep in mind, when he came to Park City, he did not speak English. So I would take a few years to learn some basic words, right? Um, he was involved in many organizations and supported the community. Uh, he took informed risks and transitioned to becoming a su successful mine owner with no background in that industry. He was innovative, driven, very optimistic. You should read some of the quotes in the papers. <laughs> it's pretty comical. Um, and uh, he was also constantly looking at ways to improve his mining operations, making it more efficient, effective, safer, a better place to work, okay? And um, he paid good dividends to his shareholders. And at the end of the day, after 25 years of doing this, um, building the littlest, the biggest little mine in the district, um, you know, he had the, the Sturgill Tunnel was going and that required continual money to keep drilling and blasting punching it through and looking for ore. And it just, it wasn't, you know, finding the big mother load, right? And he had, had to keep going back to Cincinnati, New York, and other places looking for investors. And I think after 25 years, you know, at age 62 or thereabouts, he was like, you know, I've, I've had a good run. And um, I really want to retire, okay? He didn't go broke. He didn't go Rags to riches to rags, some of the BS that's published out there. Okay. And uh, he just wanted a few more quiet years with Ida May, you know, visit some relatives in Cincinnati, do a little travel, um, maybe check out the Florida real estate as a hobby in golf. So, you know, you got to do something. <laughs> right. So, um, so in the end, he wanna... really does deserve to have a bus. <laughs> At least a bus, for sure. <laughs> Maybe a library, a stadium. <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah. So he passed away in 1929, age 66. So he didn't enjoy too many years of retirement. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's sometimes what happens when you're a, a go-getter and all of a sudden you're kicking your feet up and it's like, maybe it's a little too boring. I don't know. I uh, just said brief illness. We don't know why. Okay. Um, so before we uh, open it up for questions, uh, we just want to thank Dalton and Diane um, for pulling this together. Dalton was tremendously helpful for me to 
locate information. Um, so, you know, all the archive articles that are on microfiche, I mean, wow, it's really slick. Uh, the park record for all their articles over the years, Salt Lake Mining Review, Salt Lake Tribune, Salt Lake Herald. Sandy and I looked at hundreds of articles, I mean, just trying to understand. Um, U.S. Department of Interior, uh, National Register of Historical Places. We, we also had a nice document to look there. Um, and a friend of yours, Bridget. Um, She's uh, what making some water, not watercolored uh, prints. So. Right, yeah. Celebrate the uh, preservation of the King Kong Orbuck in Mine Cleaned Up Vermont. Uh, Bridget Michael is uh, it's doing a series of actually abstract paintings, but she's doing it using ink that's derived from plants that are all around. Mm -hmm. And her particular contribution to discovery, I think, is that she figured out that that orbit is actually a part of the uh, the King Kong train. Uh, and not not a random of the or the trans And also just a special thanks to the photographers back in the day for documenting these images mm -hmm. that are on a wall and that we also had in here. Um, this is not like whipping out a cell phone and taking a picture. <laughs> and that one photo, the sparrow at the top, the scope. I mean, these people work their butt off packing that stuff around, glass plates and chemicals and then developing them. Um, and this is expensive gear. You can imagine in the mine how easy it would be to break this stuff. So I'm just real glad that those people did, did that important service for us. And one final thank you to you all for coming and listening. Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs>
Oh, yeah, good question. So the counterweights were basically wooden boxes. <laughs> That they, just put, like, they put rocks in there. Yeah. yeah. So they either hauled the boxes up there, you know, but it's pretty advantageous to build them on site, right. you know. Um, I mean, a couple saw horses and saws and hammers and nails, and then an, an attachment point for the steel cable. And then you just you got to run a mine waste rock and just start filling it up. For the Silver King Coalition mine, that, that's the steel towers that you want from town. There's a counterweight up there. And it's little pieces of iron. <laughs> hmm. Broken wheels. You know, the same thing they could find for the body. Thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. The, the short story that you told about the uh, underground ski lift, the subway ski lift through the uh, tunnel, I think it's important to mention uh, because, as far as we know, it's the only such uh, ski lift right. that con that consisted of an underground subway connected to a mine shaft where the skiers were lifted yes. to the surface so they could ski. It's the only such thing in the world. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. You're absolutely right. And so, so one of the reasons it, why it's unique. Yes, it's very unique. So one of the reasons why the Park City. Historical Society and the Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History are so interested in preserving those structures up there at the same shaft, which yeah. is where the skiers came up, is in part because of that uniqueness, uniqueness yes. that it's the only thing like that in the world. And um, of course, the Thane shaft has started to cave underground, which threatens the head frame and the surface infrastructure yep. at that shaft location. And unfortunately, last um, winter with the record snowfall, it just completely collapsed the entire building. So we've had some real setbacks as far as trying to preserve, you know, that yes. mining facility up there. But we do intend to uh, stabilize that caving and that, uh, that underground failing of that shaft. And the state of Utah Division of Oil, Gas and Mining has teamed with the uh, Friends of Ski Mountain Mining to uh, plug that shaft, and that will be done next summer. And then we're talking to the resort and to the city about trying to clean up that site, you know, all that debris that's been created by yeah. the collapse up there. So it's, it's a big project for the Friends of Key Mountain Mining History. Absolutely. And, and in that regard, we are accepting checks of all sizes. $100,000. Thank you for your thoughts on that. What do you mean? <laughs> so, Brian, do, do we have an interpretive sign at the Thames area where skiers can learn about this? Yeah, we, there's a sign. I couldn't remember if we had that. Yes. There is an incident where they see marked out the mining spot. Oh, yeah? yeah. <laughs> I was wondering about that. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. Trip to Breaker. <laughs> Hopefully, nobody was hurt. Yeah, there were metal skis back then. Yeah. Head yeah. yeah. standards. Yeah. 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 standards. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming.